Got a couple still connecting the audio. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our little Wednesday episode here, um, coordinated by our great and brilliant Jane. Uh, so we are here to just talk a little bit about the lab's use and setup, um, working from home with your models. Um, last time we met, um, we had a couple of students and we talked about um, safely setting up your work at home and then how to use your um, digital fabrication services at UIC. So we're gonna cover the digital fabrication stuff a little bit more in depth today, but we're also gonna talk about like the basic setups and then afterwards we'll have a little bit of a Q and A. We just wanna give you guys a sense of what we're up to and what we're doing at school, um, what we're doing with some of the grad students or design students so you get a sense of what's possible um, within your studios and hopefully give you some ideas of how to work in the future. Most of what we're telling you is a little different because of remote school, but will be also applicable and helpful for you um, next year, fall and spring. So with that said, I guess we can start with our first um, short demo with Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, there's some construction going on outside. So if you hear any crazy noises, I will try and project. Um, <laughs> let me first start off by saying that I miss every single one of you and I can't wait till we're back in the shop. But until then, we're just gonna have to make do with what we have like we have been doing. Um, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to anyway. Um, we've been in quarantine now for close to a year. So you probably have a workspace set up already in your living space if you do. So if you do already, this might be a really, consider this kind of a checklist. You know, I might be covering something or saying something that you may have forgot about in your setup and if you don't have a workspace set up, this might give you the confidence to do so. So first things first, when I get set up at home in my living space, um, I wanna scope out a work surface. Um, I chose a table outside of my kitchen. Um, if I'm gonna be kicking up any dust or debris, little bits, I wanna kinda of keep that away from any food or surfaces I'm gonna be eating on. Um, fortunately, I have a table close to a window. So I want a nice work surface, nice and well lit. Um, outside of that, um, I want to make sure that I'm keeping a nice, I put down a contractor bag. Okay. Now, if I'm going to be doing anything that's going to be kicking up a lot of dust and debris, I am next to a window so I can get some airflow, but I also realize it's extremely cold outside. So maybe not the best idea. But if I am gonna be kicking up dust and debris or using any paints, things like that, two things I'd like to remind everyone. Uh, first thing, um, the project lab is closed for general access, but the overnight area, which also contains the spray booth is open. You just need card swipe access while the building is open. So if that's something that you are interested in and you weren't sure that that was open, you can use that space. Um, just feel free to email me with your UIN just to make sure that you're on that card swipe access list. And then two, here's a little tip and trick. If you, um, if you wanna continue working at home and kind of transporting your stuff to the overnight areas a little much, um, I like to use my Dremel at home. This has the potential to kick up a little bit of dust. Um, so if I position myself with this guy, so I have a little, these are called bucket head backs. I can get them from Home Depot. They're pretty cheap. Um, they're really great. They just attach to a five gallon bucket. Hint, hint, wink, wink, might be something you want to keep around in studio. Really great for cleanup, but I just clamp this to the table. And again, if I position myself to where I'm standing, I've created myself a little down draft table if you must. So really great for cleanup and things like that. And they're really cheap. Um, so once I kind of have my space set up, I have my contractor bag down. I also want to set up 
another little barrier between my piece and my table. Okay, so I have a piece of plywood that I had around. Um, if I have a mat board, great. If I'm really in a bind, I can use a cutting board from my kitchen. You just want to make sure that there's, again, another little barrier between your work piece and your table. But that brings me to while we're actually working. Okay, so as architecture students, we are probably going to be using these exacto blades all right now when we are working from home there are added layers of comfortability while we work from home which is great i want us to be comfortable working at home but i would also like to remind everyone to stay diligent be mindful practice zen while we are working for example i have a project due tomorrow Okay, I got started a little late. I'm in my pajamas, my roommate's home, we're kind of chatting. I have Spotify on, I have music blasting, I have my Netflix on. I have some added distractions. Not to say that you can't keep some stuff on while you're working, but I just wanna make sure that I'm not super distracted because if you've ever been in an authorization with myself or Nick, we like to remind everyone that what is the tool that students always seem to injure themselves with it is the exacto blade. All right, so here comes the fun part. A little bit of first aid. So if I am, if I do cut myself, here's the construction. So in the project lab, it's great. And if you're in the studio, you can always come to the project lab and I can help you out. God, that construction. Wow, I hope it's not too loud. Um, great. Uh, if you are at home, I like to keep a roll of paper towels, I keep a little first aid kit, and some band-aids handy. All right. So if I am to cut myself, gather myself, remain calm. But and I'm not a medic, but here's a little, here's a little tip. All right. If you are to cut yourself. You want to apply pressure and keep that wound above your heart. Okay. From here, I can then assess what needs to happen. I just want to slow that down that bleeding, everything. And I can maybe even get my roommates, parents, siblings involved. If needed, just remind them to wear some latex gloves while they're doing it. And then from there, when I'm done, I can kind of unclamp, remove everything, and I can fold up my contractor table, contractor bag, and it's all clean for me. That being said, after all that, if you have questions, need advice, need advice on where to get a specific tool or materials, you can always email me, Nick, or Christian. Um, we're happy to help you out. But that's just quick little tips on how to set up your space. I'm gonna turn my sound off now because it's really loud. Thank you, Natalie. Um, hope everyone can hear me also as well. Um, yeah, so Natalie can escape construction noises or loud noises even if she's at UIC or at home. So that's unfortunate, but we're with you. Um, I like the part about distractions because even when you're working in the studio there's often a lot of distractions and we want to stay focused i actually find it easier to get distracted and to be a little bit sloppier and less safe at home because i'm more comfortable there so in studio or, or at uic i'm a little bit more professional a little bit more on top of things at home i get a little bit too lazy i start using my foot as a clamp or as a sawhorse knee kind of thing and then it gets a little bit tricky from there so just stay safe um be mindful of your surroundings and like especially that it's winter um don't push things like painting to be indoors um either try to wait or do it at another time but um that was really helpful um i'm going to now switch to my little slideshow And okay, no. Um, wait a minute. 
I don't want presenter view. Can people see this? Go full screen. Is that good? All right. So CNC at UIC. Um, this is a little presentation I put together. It's got some work samples from students at UIC Architecture. So if you recognize some of the projects, they are from UIC. Um, just a disclaimer, I'm not going to present this work or this slideshow anywhere but this meeting. So you don't have to worry about the work being seen by other schools or other people if it happens to be your work. Um, I'm just going to cover the basics of this service at UIC. We've been using it more heavily with the design school, um, especially during this remote work stuff, but I wanted to kind of do a refresher for how it could be used for architecture and for something for you guys to think about if you're assigned models. So um, it is a shared resource. We use it with design and architecture, but it's a service that we've been operating um, from the project lab for maybe five or six years now. And um, we run anywhere from 30 to maybe 100 or 200 jobs each semester. So last semester we ran about 100 pieces from just a handful of students, but they all did you know, more than 10, so it added up. And then previous semesters, we would do group projects, all that kind of thing. So that's a little bit of a refresher for what it is. What is a CNC router? So a CNC router is a computer controlled cutting machine, which uses a handheld router as a cutting tool. Um, this picture here is a similar router to the one we have. Um, our router can cut wood, uh, plywood, uh, some plastics and foams. Um, some routers and ours would actually be able to cut brass or aluminum or soft metals, but we don't um, switch between metal and wood. Um, so we just have our machine specific for foam and metal, that kind of thing. How does the CNC work? Um, so we first want to make our Rhino file or our model in CAD software. Uh, we can import from SolidWorks and other CAD programs. Um, it's great if you can help us out with importing your models into Rhino before you send them to us, but we can work with what you have if you don't use Rhino. Since you guys probably have professors that force you to learn this frustrating and sometimes elegant software called Rhino, I'm sure you'll um, be familiar. Um, so that's where we make our model. Um, you, can, you can submit anything that you want and we'll review it. So that's what I always tell people if they're asking questions in, in the front end, just give us what you have, give us pictures of what you're looking for. Um, you can even give us pictures of what you want your final model to look like and we'll try to help you get there. Um, for the next steps, we want the computer to generate uh, G code using um, RhinoCam. And these are the numbers that tell the computer where to go. Um, so RhinoCam is an extension, uh, like a plugin on top of Rhino. So we can take your model, load it onto the CNC computer and start working directly from there. There's no steps in between that really change it. Um, we want to visualize um, our, our G code and what we call a tool path. So this blue line that you see here is the path that the tool will take across our material and how it wants to carve. And the red and the yellow are sort of how it's traveling in space between one point to another. So um, once it's visualized, we'll do a simulation where we, we in the computer software, we put a little um, stock material in of how big your wood or foam piece is. And then we press play and we see how it'll go. Um, when we do the simulation, um, I used to have students there with me to kind of see if there were issues or changes of shapes. Um, for, for instance, when you're cutting interior curves, it has to be rounded because we can't cut flat. Since it's not a laser cutter, it can't cut as much detail. So it has to be kind of to the roundness of the router. So, um, but now that we're remote, um, we do the simulation and then we just kind of send you guys um, screen captures and pictures of what it looks like just to double check everything. Um, once we have everything set, we can clamp our material to the work surface and we can put our router bit in and we can press go. 
Um, our equipment, we can use anywhere from an eighth inch small router bit all the way up to about half inch. And they can have round or flat ends and they can be fun to play with different types of bits. Some of our bits have kind of pointed ends and those can be used for engraving or for carving details. I'll show some of those uh, later. And um, the more complex your shapes and your carving is, the more limitations you might run into. So how 3D printing, you're kind of starting from a the bed size and you're traveling up and the limitations are about the structure of it, how it can hold itself up. For the CNC, it's about how we can carve into the material with a small bit um, to save time, but also you know, the depth of cut. So if we have a really small blade, it might only be one inch long, and then we won't be able to cut four inches deep, something like that. So keep in consideration, the more detail you get, the more limitations you might run into. Um, you can cut a simple square if that's what you choose. If you don't have a table saw and you're working on a school project where you need simple shapes, we've done that for students. So um, that's how we make our cuts. Um, next question is, why would you use the router? So kind of in industry sense, these are used for door carvings, interior or exterior decorations, wood paneling. Um, you see a lot of signs made out of CNC and also more in the art and design realm, you'll see mold and mold making, um, furniture pieces and like prototyping. So, you know, even on this call, Natalie had done a really cool mold on our CNC machine with foam to then use later as a metal casting thing. So you can do a lot just with a simple tool. Um, it's really precise. So if you have curves or cuts that would be difficult to accomplish on other machines, um, let's say you're trying to use the bandsaw and you're not getting smooth enough cuts, they don't look quite like you're drawing on the computer. Um, the CNC router is a really good way to kind of translate that information from your model to your physical model. Um, they're fast and repeatable, so you can make several of the same shapes. Um, this picture here, there are some coasters and trays that we were working on with a design student. Um, this is just a, a small percentage of the pieces we ended up doing with this student, but you can see there's some where we just stretched one dimension or we did multiples to see what they would look like with different materials, different types of wood. So it's really easy to do the exact same thing over and over again. Um, for prototyping, again, back to furniture, but also like if you wanna see what your model looks like in a physical form and not just on the computer, it's a good way to sort of get like a physical 3D printout of what you're working on and make adjustments. Um, it'll also probably be cheaper to do bigger objects than 3D printing. So if you want to do like a fast pink foam carving on the CNC, it's a good way to get that information. Um, it's also a really good learning experience. So I always tell students that if you go out and you work for a firm that has a CNC router like as part of their machine shop or their wood shop, or if they reach out to CNC people as contractors for their model making, um, especially when you have exhibitions and um, big presentations to a client or something, you might have to work with a person who operates a CNC router and learn how to communicate with them. So we're a little bit more patient and we're a little bit more understanding and we know how you guys and what you're working on in school. So it's a good idea to get some practice to kind of learn how you would communicate what you need. Um, I found, especially with like working remotely right now, the students are learning really good ways to effectively communicate with me about what they want. Um, that's a lot different than when we were in person learning. So they're emailing me more pictures. They're telling me more about the assignment or the prompt for the assignment, um, giving me more context. And then on the backside, I'm giving them a lot more video images. We're getting on Zooms if we need to, hopping on little chats, that kind of thing. So. It's a different type of interaction, but it can be very similar to what you'd expect um, there. So that's why you would use it. Um, how is it used in architecture? Um, the biggest thing I see is a lot of carved site models. So the image is kind of a sloppy, messy version of a site model. Um, we do a lot of large site models for group projects at UIC and often exhibitions. 
we use a lot of the pink foam, just like cheap foam, st stuff that's easy to paint. Um, and it can show up in a lot of these like pretty nice architectural exhibitions. And we really like that we can use our CNC for that purpose. Um, another way it's used is for complex shapes. So if there's shapes that would be traditionally like hard to accomplish with traditional woodworking techniques or with traditional hand tools or even power tools, um, they might be good for the CNC. For example, um, the foam piece that we saw a little bit earlier, um, if they wanted to do that manually, they would need a manual mill, a drill press, a bandsaw, also some hand tools and power tools. So it's nice when we can just limit that to one machine. Um, we see a lot of furniture designs. So some of the faculty even, um, Anya and um, I know Thomas Kelly a little bit and some of the um, design faculty have used CNC fabrication for furniture design or for even prototyping pieces. So they want a quick turnaround. Let's see how big this chair is when it's actually in a physical space, um, that kind of thing. And um, the other thing is maybe things that would be too large or expensive for 3D printing or would pose as a challenge to make by hand, like I already said. But, um, you know, basically things that you want directly translated from your computer. Um, my last note is about firms. Um, some of them use them, some of them own them. So that's just the same point I made earlier. Um, how to use the CNC at UIC. So, You'll go to our UIC Labs website. Christian's going to cover how to use the web, labs, uh, website a little bit more in depth. And it's very similar to how you would use with 3D printing and CNC now. Um, the Discord is great. The Labs Discord, if you have questions, we try to get on top of that right away. Sometimes Christian has to get me to jump on for CNC questions, but that works as well. And you can also email me directly. So I'll put my email um, in the chat when I'm done speaking. Um, next steps are you submit your file for review, uh, you fill out a form for what material you're using and um, the number of pieces and the sizes. So before you do your submission, I, I tell people to wait on purchasing the material because once we receive your file, we're going to review that and see how much material we'll actually need. Um, let's say you're making a tray that's 12 inches wide by 11 inches deep and you buy a piece of wood that's 12 by 12. That might be cutting it a little short. We might need a full inch on all sides. So that kind of thing is really important um, to reach out to us while you're starting to think about these ideas um, and we can help you get them finalized. Um, you'll also receive an estimate for how long it'll take. When I run the simulation, I can see this is a two hour job, this is a four hour job, um, what materials <clears throat> you'll need, et cetera. So, it's a good idea just to consult with us. Um, and then we run the job and you can pick it up at school. So uh, we can do contact lists if, um, if you want. We usually leave pieces now in the basement studio or outside the office kind of thing. Um, but we're um, in the project lab a couple of days a week. So we can also just do pick up that way. Um, rules for working remote. So. We have a four by four bed on our CNC, four feet by four feet. We need to keep things under that scale and size. So if you're trying to do really, really large objects out of cardboard or foam or something, we might have to break those into smaller pieces. Um, <clears throat> for medium or hard density materials, we have a two inch depth limit and we can go four inches depth for foam. So that's where we start seeing some of the larger site models and things. Um, this note about two hour jobs was that before we've worked remote, we try to keep all the CNC jobs within a two hour time frame, four at the max, so that we could schedule more than two students a day, especially coming up on midterms and finals. <clears throat> now that we're running the jobs and that you're not present to run them and to watch them, we can do longer jobs. So. We've done some five hour jobs, some six hour jobs, nothing too crazy, but more detailed work. Um, it's not as much of a problem now that we don't have the need to have the students there in person and that we have more flexibility with our schedule than we had before. We're not running 
demos and other classes out of the project lab so I can keep the machine running a little bit longer. And also um, we have contactless pickup. So um, that's my basic uh, check-in about the CNC. I encourage everyone to use the service if they can. Um, it's also a good idea to stay on top of things, even if they're not being assigned by your faculty. If you wanna learn how to use this for next fall or next spring or for your senior year, this is a good time to just try something out. Um, it should be school related. We're not really doing personal projects, but um, it's, a good, it's a good resource. Um, it's an old machine, but it runs really well. So we wanna use it while we have it. All right, I can hand it over to Christian now if he's all set up. I am ready, I think. Hi, everybody. I'm Christian, um, if you haven't met me already. Um, I'm your Fab Lab specialist, reporting to you live from the Fab Lab. Um, I'm going to focus on kind of talking about our Project Lab Fab Lab website to, or today, um, just because not everybody knows about it. There's a lot of helpful links on there, and it's very critical for accessing some of the lab services. Um, so let me see, can I pull this up? What are all these exclamation part? Mm -hmm. I shift. No, here we go. Oh, I think as I updated soon, it's not liking me. I will be right back. It seems. Sorry about this. Do we lose Christian? I think he, he might he have logged back. off. Yeah, he'll be back. Here he is. And I'm back. Let's see if this works. You know, you think you have everything set up and then you update something and it just ruins everything. Um, here we go, Safari. All right. Can everybody see the website? I get a thumbs up from somebody. No, maybe. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so when you open up our splash page, I'll also drop the links in the tab. You can find the links for the website in the architecture newsletter, I believe also. Um, uh, we have some general hours here, um, some helpful information. And then up here at the top in your navigation bar, there's a bunch of links. Um, we'll start with laser cutting. Uh, if you go to our laser cutting splash page, the first thing you'll see is our hours, obviously, again, and then the important updates, things that you might need to know. Um, if ever a machine is down, we'll post it here. If the surface is unavailable, we'll also post it here. Um, typically, we've been only uh, running class projects, but service has been so slow that I'd be interested if you're interested in, interested in just experimenting with the materials, you know, running something personal for yourself, uh, please reach out and discuss it with me. This goes for 3D printing also. Uh, it all just depends on the time because once things get really busy in here, they get really busy uh, and lead times for everything can be up to a week. Um, but because it's so slow, we're able to kind of turn around pretty quickly in like less than 24 hours sometimes. Um, so one of the first links you'll see is pr approved materials. Approved materials, <laughs> has approved materials on it. And it also has a giant list of everything you should not bring to the lab and cut. Typically, some of these things you can cut in other labs, but with our lab, uh, it's our ventilation is kind of set up in a specific way that it's not the safest to run some of these more toxic uh, substances. And some of these things just catch fire when you, uh, when you use them. So it's a hazard to the machine and it's expensive machinery and it does not like fire. Um, so going back, we have our machine options. Uh, that will just give you a very short breakdown of the two types or brands of machines that we have. Um, there are actually three types of machines, but the and it's two different types of universals, an older version, and then two of the newer versions. Um, and the main difference is the software that they use, which 
you don't really need to know since you only like you just have to create a, an Illustrator file to 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 use this this machinery. Um, and the important thing to know is uh, there's different sizes in regards to your work area for uh, the Trotec and the Universal machines. Um, Trotec is definitely a lot larger. Um, but it's oftentimes the most sought after mach machine because of how big it is. Um, so if you're really trying to make something in uh, uh, like a high demand time that's specific to the Trotec, you might end up with longer wait times for your project. Um, just a small note. But all of this can be uh, figured out by just communicating with us. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight this almost annoyingly so. Uh, please, 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 even if you're not fully finished with your project and ready to bring it to us, talk to us. Um, we love to talk. We love to talk about your projects. We love to help you with your projects. And when I say we, I don't just mean me, Nick, and Natalie. Uh, the Fab Lab is currently uh, has as proctors that monitor the Discord, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and they're on at very specific times to answer any questions. Um, to also just kind of free up my hands so I can uh, create helpful instructional things for you all and also just run projects and not have to, to stick with uh, or have to sort out meetings, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so going back to laser cutting, you keep scrolling down on the splash page, which is slightly different from last semester. Uh, your laser cutting steps are right here. Um, it is very important for you to read through this if you have not done so. Um, and it might be good just to get a refresher uh, if you have done it in the past, uh, because most of our questions or most of the questions that I get can be totally answered by just reading through the steps <laughs> for signing up. Uh, we have uh, links to download the Universal and Trotech laser cutting templates that we have set up for you all. Uh, it is critical that you use these templates um, when sending us files to laser cut for you uh, because we have like very specific colors that you need to select for different processes. Um, going down even further, we have a uh, file review meeting sign up, which is both for laser cutting and for 3D printing. Uh, this is not a like final submission meeting. This is merely for us to meet with you and discuss, look over your file. More often than not, everybody has corrections that they need to go back and edit before actually submitting their file. Um, we will eventually give you a link for you to submit your file to our order queue. And that gets populated in this very official uh, spreadsheet of ours that we can track uh, everything that we're working on. Um, it's also important to note for laser cutting, the service is free. All you have to really worry about is buying your own material, buying the right material, cutting it down to size, dropping it off and picking it up. Um, of course, there's probably a tons of little questions that will pop up within your file review meeting or any discussion that we have and kind of getting to this point in the process. Um, we do have contactless drop off and pick up. Um, I'm kind of shut off in this room. There's a bench outside that you can drop things off for me to, to grab for you. Um, if I'm not here, it's also possible to just kind of leave things for me. If you take a picture and send it to me over Discord, once again, we can discuss that in the future. Um, moving on to 3D printing, it's very similar on the splash, splash page. Uh, our first link here is how long. Um, this should go to, yes, I did it right. Um, this will go to a kind of print turnaround time, estimated time page that our lovely Daisy Ruiz um, and the design department or design school has uh, created for us and will take you on a beautiful graphic design journey with the for, for how long it will take to actually get your project done. Um, 3D printing, if you have never done it before, takes a while sometimes, even for small objects. Like, do I have an example here? Um, even something as small as this can take up to an hour to print, depending on the settings and the optimization and everything like that. Um, so if you're curious and how long any sort of design might take, uh, I would say it's safe to say at least a day or two to actually 3D print it. Um, once again, if it's a high volume time, 
uh, it could take up to a week to actually get these turned around. If, if there's any issues in the printing process that, and for instance, prints can take up to 24 hours to actually uh, print out an object, uh, it, sets, it sets us back significantly if one of those messes up. So plan ahead and communicate with us as much as possible and we will communicate with you, um, especially when it comes to like lead times and things like that. Um, right now it's very dead in the lab. So you can have something in your hands within two days potentially. Uh, we do have a uh, Calendly uh, appointment widget similar to laser cutting for you to sign up for your submission file review. Uh, and same with that, once you've actually uh, had that file review meeting and your files are ready to go, we'll send you a link for you to uh, submit your file online for it to get populated in one of our spreadsheets. Um, is there anything else that's special in here that I should note? Um, to have your file submission meeting, you need to join our Discord server. And to join our Discord server, you need to apply with this application. It's, you could potentially just join our Discord at any moment. Um, this helps us kind of keep track of who's using the lab. Um, it's kind of just a helpful metric for me to get an idea. Um, once you fill this out, we'll send you a link to our Discord to join. Usually those links expire within 24 hours. Um, so make sure that you, as soon as you see the email, uh, you, you join. It's free to sign up. Um, you have to go through Discord, obviously, if you haven't already created one, uh, to sign up through them. Uh, and then you might need to reopen our link again in order to actually access our Discord. Um, when it comes to our Discord, it can be a little confusing if you've never used it before. It's definitely not the most beautiful uh, UI in the entire world. Um, our splash page for this is our welcome tab. Um, immediate, be immediately below that is our on duty section. Here you will see, for instance, Daisy just signed into work. Uh, you'll see whoever's on call and how long they will be on call for. If uh, somebody hasn't posted uh, that day, usually there's nobody on call, uh, which means it defaults to me. And my Discord is always on and my phone is always receiving alerts. Um, so probably the easiest way to reach us is always through Discord. Um, you, of course, you can email the Fab Lab, which I'll include that in a link. And I think that's also in the uh, newsletter section for the Fab Lab. Uh, or the architecture newsletter. We also have an announcements page here in case like there's a change in scheduling, machines will be down or something like that. These, this is where you'll see an announcement. It'll also be on our website. Um, there's a lab staff only. So if you ever wanna join our staff, you'll get to access this lab section. Um, it's where all the hot gossip is, of course. Um, in our questions section, we have a general questions. Uh, if you don't, know who to ask or where to go just post in here it can be absolutely anything even if it's just modeling help i guess i should mention that uh yes we do laser cutting 3d printing in here uh but all of our proctors are very skilled in the software that they use um so please reach out to us if you ever have any questions in regards to like how do you model something i can't get this to work um we will absolutely help you this goes for illustrator also um there's a CNC tab if you want to reach Nick. Uh, my proctors will also answer any questions if they can. We're not totally trained up on the CNC, but we will find somebody who can answer your questions and it will probably be Nick. Um, 3D printing, uh, same thing, laser cutting. See, you can see it's been used a lot. And then our wonderful off topic tab, which is a bunch of randomness uh, that we've added over the couple months. Um, if you ever find something interesting and you wanna you know, share it with the rest of us, please feel free. Um, and here, I'll probably end up moving this around later because there's some helpful scripts for uh, working in Rhino and then also working in Illustrator that I think everybody should know. Um, but that's pretty much it for our uh, Discord. Oh, one important thing you can see here over on the side, uh, if we're not talking in one of our channels, uh, we're probably talking in a direct message, or we also have voice channels in these meeting rooms down here. And that's where you'll have your file submission review meeting. Um, we'll send you a link. Currently they're locked, so nobody can like jump in and interrupt our meeting. Um, 
but they're, it's kind of like Zoom. You can join, a bunch of people can join, you can share your screen. There are permissions that you need to enable on your computer to allow Discord to access your camera and also access your screen. Um, so please look into that. I'll probably end up making a helpful tutorial for setting up Discord for using with the lab, but it's well documented. So if you search it on Google, you'll probably find an answer fairly quickly. Um, our direct mess or your direct message tab will be up here in the home. Um, and then also any new direct messages will show up right below it and you can access those immediately. Um, we will use this to contact you for any questions that we have about your, your, your files or your material, um, pickup times, delays and orders. So please, please download Discord or you can download it. You can use it through your web browser. I like having it on my phone, but I understand if you don't want to put it on your phone, um, but definitely check it um, if you are uh, planning on using any of our lab services because we use it for everything. Um, and that's pretty much it for Discord. Um, I guess I'll go back to the website. The rest of this talk will kind of be about uh, kind of finishing 3D prints that you have. That seems to be kind of the biggest question I get in the lab. Um, so I'm gonna focus on talking about glues and gap fillers. Um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about sanding too since it's a critical part about this. Um, in regards to sanding, uh, your 3D prints will often have like tool marks, if you will. Um, it's a texture kind of created from the process of the print being made. Uh, if you've never seen 3D printing before, it's kind of hard to see on one of these darker objects. Maybe this will help. Um, it creates, uh, there's a fine tip at the, uh, it's a CNC machine. So it's like a hot glue gun, fancy hot glue gun. Uh, attached to a CNC machine uh, that raises and lowers uh, the bed. Um, each line that the machine makes uh, creates a layer and then each layer stacks on top of each other and that creates the full resolution or at least what we refer to the resolution uh, or to what we refer to as the resolution of a print uh, is determined by these layers and how thick these layers are. Typically, our machines are running at a 0.2 layer height, which is like, it's nice, but it's not 0.061 millimeters, which is very fine, but takes so much longer to print. Um, and in areas where there's a gradual change in elevation, you'll start to get these like stepped uh, hillside marks. Um, and a lot of people want to get rid of those because it doesn't create the smooth object that they were imagining in their mind. Um, and to do that, you can use, you can either sand it, which would take a lot of time. I've tried doing it on many 3D prints. Um, you can use regular old sandpaper for wood. Um, I recommend if you're working inside and you don't have a vacuum cleaner, um, I recommend wet sanding. And of course, always use a respirator. Um, if you're wet sanding with uh, regular old sandpaper, make sure you're not using too much water, but just enough water that the particulate isn't getting kicked up in the air. Um, and of course, always at the end, never dry wipe your surfaces, always spray a little bit of water. Don't use like a power hose or something that will kick the, the dust up in the air. Just lightly spray your environment, wipe it down with a cloth and do that two or three times. And then I will even follow that up with a vacuum clean. But that's because I've use this for a really long time. I mean, you should do this no matter what. <laughs> I won't even go down that route. Um, as far as filling in gaps. So let's say you don't want to sand the plastic because it takes a really long time and you will still end up seeing some striations uh, despite it being glassy smooth. Um, I have found many products that worked well. And if you go to our website and the example page and go into uh, gap fillers or glues. Uh, I have a number of things that I've like tested and I'm continuing to like add to this and post examples for. Uh, but my favorite thing to use for both gluing and filling gaps has been this plastic metal, metal Bondo stuff. Um, it's definitely toxic to breathe in. So well ventilated is very important whether you're using, you know, just a little bit or a lot of it. 
but it works really, really well. Um, it kind of has, has the consistency of a, like an acetone toothpaste that you don't want to put on your toothbrush and put in your mouth, it's very toxic. Um, and will fill in gaps that are even like uh, an eighth of an inch wide or, or deep. Um, I've been using it to kind of create this, uh, this loop thing that I've been working on. It does give a little bit of flex. So it's got that strength. Uh, you can sand this really nicely um, and then you can even reapply it easily. Um, but once again, the dust that it creates is very toxic. So you wanna be very careful in mitigating like how much is getting kicked up in your environment. Uh, definitely get that shop back that uh, Natalie mentioned um, and definitely wet sand these objects. It's important to also like wipe down your object and clean it after you've wet sanded it because there's a ton of dust on it. Uh, and if that dries up, it will get kicked into the air. Um, so the Bondo metal or plastic metal is great. My favorite, uh, my second favorite filler and sand, sander or filler, I guess, and primer also is this Rust-Oleum primer two-in-one filler and sandable, and sand, sandable I guess. Um, I will probably, after I've filled in some of these gaps, smooth these down, I will probably follow up with this. Um, this example here, which is also on the website, if you go all the way down to the bottom, uh, was only, only used, I didn't sand it at all until after applying the filler. Um, and I'm able to get a really great surface finish from this. I'll probably follow this up with like a Montana gold, uh, like what's a, a glossy spray paint, just a clear glossy spray paint, or even a matte finish. Um, any of the Montana Gold products, as far as spray paint go, goes, are really great. To get those in Chicago, you can go up to Evanston, and there's a Blick there that has like a giant wall of spray paint. It's incredible. Um, if you love spray paint, it's the place to go in Chicago. Um, but I definitely, I don't know if you can get this stuff there, but I got this at Home Depot, or I think it was Lowe's. Um, if you want to get this Bono stuff, you can get it online, or almost all auto body shops like AutoZone will carry this. Um, it's really great. Um, I do have some like less toxic smelling options on the website. You can always use like Fast Patch 30, which is just like uh, a spackling compound for drywall. Um, but I think the Bondo stuff is, is great through and through. Um, if you need just a glue though, uh, I recommend hot glue regular or the hot glue made for wood um, and then gel super glue, which is really, really incredible. Um, this object here wasn't finished that nicely, but each one of these joints here is a, is, was glued together. So it, it's pretty strong um, for, for how unusual this object is. Um, so I recommend the super glue gel, Rust-Oleum primer, um, or a two-in-one primer and uh, my Bondo plastic metal. Of course, all the other things that I've like posted online work great, um, but those are my three favorites. Um, if, if you do need to create a really large 3D print and you need it to be like uh, really adhered to each other, you can always turn to PLA friction welding, which you can use with a Dremel. Um, but because you're using a Dremel and you're using, you're chucking up a piece of plastic to literally apply pressure and like melt plastic to plastic just from friction, uh, little bits will go everywhere. Uh, I've almost lost an eye a couple times <laughs> from just not wearing safety glasses. So if you are using one of, or this process, make sure you use safety glasses. I mean, if you're using any power tools, use safety glasses and a, and a respirator, definitely a respir respirator. Uh, safety things, I guess we should mention, uh, like Natalie said, do not spray this stuff inside. Uh, find a, either the, the spray booth uh, in the overnight area or go outside. Um, don't let these off gas in your room either. Um, you don't wanna be breathing this stuff in. The toxic fumes that it puts out are toxic. 
Um, like one of these products was talking about like overexposure to this will like lead to like hearing issues or something like that among other things. So do not, do not use or do not use these materials without taking, you know, the necessary safety precautions. Um, I think I covered it all. I gotta check my notes. Um, yeah, that's about it. Oh, one last thing. If you want an alternative to spray paint, uh, Kills brushable primer works really well. It takes a little bit longer. It's not as clean, but it's a really great primer and it's not gonna like off gas as much toxic fumes. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. I'll add these links to the chat too. Yeah, so we have just a few minutes before people might have to leave, but if there are any um, questions, you can put them in the chat or um, you can unmute and we can answer anything. We also, um, I can post my email here. Um, email is a good way to reach out to us if you're not already on the Discord and you have questions right away, uh, we can answer those. So um, does anyone have anything? I also added my email just to double check if you wanted to double check if um, you were on the card swipe access for overnight area, if anyone needed that. Okie dokie. Well, Christian, I was taking notes. That was very informative. <laughs> yeah, same. I've been, I love this stuff. It really changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> and this plastic metal stuff. It's really crazy. Sands beautifully. Yeah. As long as they don't change the formula like they did with the yeah. original stuff. I'd be another thing that I'm kind of concerned about is wondering if like uh, something that I've, I've been realizing over the years is that there's many different types of, of PLA, which is the type of plastic we 3D print with um, and different solvents react differently to that plastic. So some people are like, you can use this stuff to like smooth out 3D prints. Um, like some sort of methyl acetate or something like that. Uh, is something that people have been using for PLA smoothing, uh, but not all PLA will be smoothed by it, which is interesting. Um, for instance, a lot of things that people recommend does not smooth out the PLA that we use in the lab. Yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention with um, the CNC service and laser cutting and sort of like what materials are accessible, we don't have as firm of a band material list um, in the project lab because the uh, the way we're cutting and processing the material requires less ventilation and we have plenty of it for the CNC machine. So we can cut um, ABS and other plastics on the CNC machine that might be banned for laser cutting. You won't get the same level of detail or precision, but let's say you're you know, working with faculty on an exhibition model and you need like this needs to be a certain type of plastic for the the look of it um we can often bounce back and forth between laser cutting and 3d printing and cnc work so keep that in mind all right well if everyone has taken notes and seen the questions and emails i guess we can start saying goodbye to people Thanks a lot, Christian and Natalie. That was really helpful. Thank you. I'm excited to get back on the model making train. Yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Yep. Don't hesitate to email us. Yeah, please reach out. Don't be shy. <laughs> Bye, Adrian. Bye, Adrian. Bye, Adrian. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah.